Assalamualaikum and good morning ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day three of Digital Skills Week at the Malaysia Tech Month 2021. We're coming to you live virtually. My name is Hasro. I'll be your host for the day. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here this fine morning, 18th of August 2021. I'd like to thank everybody in attendance for taking time out to join us today on this virtual platform enabling us to connect even in these unpredictable times. For those who are just tuning in, Bring, let's bring you up to speed. So, the Malaysia Tech Month, or MTF 2021, is launched by Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MDEX, throughout the month of August as a virtual month-long curation of electrifying digital and technology keynotes, workshops, discussion panels, and business matching sessions. It will feature a distinguished group of local and international industry speakers and investors to share their expert thoughts and experiences in 4IR-driven digital economy. So, MTM 2021 will see programs that will allow the spotlight to be shown upon digital ecosystem leaders and creators, leading edge companies, as well as talents, enabling all stakeholders to discover new perspectives on domestic and global trends in artificial intelligence, drone tech, data analytics, fintech, Islamic fintech, e-commerce, ag tech, video games and animation, and also not forgetting the digital workforce. Before we move on, allow me to convey some housekeeping guidelines. Number one, any questions for our speakers, you may submit them via the Q&A comment box below. Number two, meeting and chat rooms for attendees are available for your networking convenience. Number three, please complete the survey for each of the sessions for us to continuously serve you better. And last but not least, number four, should you require technical assistance, please chat with the admin on the virtual platform. Thank you. Without further ado, let's go and welcome the first session of the day entitled An Inspiring Story. Not just digital skills, but it's inspiring digital skills. Presenting this session is Haiyan Chang, the Chief of Staff, Xbox, Designer and Inventor, at Microsoft. An innovation and technology leader, Hayan has spent the past 20 years working hands-on in software engineering, user experience, hardware R&D, service design, cloud platforms, design thinking, and blue sky envisioning. She has also served as an inventor and TV host on the BBC series, Big Life Fix, inventing cutting edge technology in support of people and communities in need. Over to you, Haiyan. Hello, everyone. I'm Haiyan Jung, Chief of Staff at Xbox. And I'm here today to talk to you about building ideas, products, solutions toward a world that we all want to live in, where technology and culture have a role to play in building that fantastic world. I'm honored to be speaking to you at the Malaysian Tech Month 2021. It's been a challenging 18 months for all of us around the world, working, studying through a global pandemic, many folks feeling isolated with barriers to connecting and achieving their goals. And this period has highlighted more than ever the importance of technology, communication and culture in evolving to new ways of working and living. I'm hopeful that we will usher in a new era of technology to build towards a better world, especially from regions such as Malaysia, Southeast Asia, and Asia. But first, a little bit about my journey. I was born in China, and at the age of eight, my family moved from China to Australia. Um, it was a massive amount of cultural adjustment in both language, I, I didn't speak any English, I had to learn English, um, in both kind of uh, cultural outlook, the focus of uh, where everybody spent their time, lifestyle. And so I really found myself almost alone in this completely new Western culture. It was a bit of a culture shock. From an early age, I discovered a passion for technology and problem solving. And I found through technology, there was a common language that I could share with others to talk about how do we create solutions? How do we tinker? How do we write 
little bits of code or software. And from there, I went on to study software engineering and became a software engineer for a number of years in data warehousing and the biomed industries. And from software engineering, I really felt a passion for understanding more about people and designing user experiences. So I went and did a master's in design and user research. I was a designer consulting in innovation and technology for about seven years, creating products and services across industries like entertainment, finance, consumer products. And this led me to Microsoft about eight years ago, where I led innovation teams in Xbox and Microsoft Research. And now I do something that sits between technology, design and business strategy as the chief of staff for Xbox. At Xbox, we are bringing the joy and community of gaming to everyone on the planet. Whether you play every day on a dedicated console, on a PC, or you play a few minutes on your phone on your way to work. We consider you to be one of the three billion players in the world today. And we believe that gaming has that power to bring people together to create shared social experiences that transcend our everyday lives. To do this, we at Xbox are on a journey to transform from a console business into a gaming ecosystem. That means we are creating the world's most powerful consoles ever built to deliver gaming into your living rooms. We are creating the best PC gaming experiences. We are delivering games to every device that you might own through cloud streaming. And ultimately, we've created a new product called Game Pass, which is about delivering hundreds of games for one price in a subscription service so that you can try out new games with your friends without having to invest in the initial costs of buying new games. And across all of this and across everything that I've done, I see the need for the diversity of voices and skills and technology. I also see the importance of transforming us as workers in technology, that our skills become flexible and malleable so that we might start out in software engineering, move into user research, into design, into strategy. And this is really an essential approach, an essential culture that I think we must adapt to as we move into the next era of technology products and tools. And when I talk about diversity, I mean diversity in our own skills, but also diversity in teams in bringing around the table people with different skills, different voices and opinions and abilities into that same discussion so that everybody has something vital to contribute into this next iteration of the world. I want to talk to you a little bit about Microsoft Research, where I was previously before joining Xbox as chief of staff. So Microsoft Research is an organization that was founded by Bill Gates about 20 years ago, and it really focuses on cutting edge academic research that contributes back to the wealth of knowledge through publication and academic conferences, but also bringing cutting edge research into new Microsoft products so that Microsoft we are always at the forefront of what technology can deliver. In research, we are really focused on this culture of diverse voices, diverse skills, working across computer science researchers from lots of different disciplines, from machine learning to human computer interaction through deep new mathematical algorithms. At the same time, one of the key moments in my journey was also working with the BBC in the UK on a documentary series called The Big Life Fix. This was a series putting together seven creatives from across the UK to think about how technology could support and solve the challenges being faced by people and communities in need. 
I'm going to talk to you about a few stories from that series because they are great case studies of how we can leverage this combined diversity of skills in software engineering and hardware and user research and design to really address people's problems in the world. Lastly, I want to talk about an approach of using technology to solve problems. One of my design icons, Eileen Gray, who was an architect and a furniture designer, had this amazing quote where she said, to create, one must first question everything. And this is something that I really hold on to. And I hope that you'll also take on board to some extent that whatever you might be doing in your careers, in your everyday lives, you also take a step back and question what you are doing and question whether what you are creating is working towards better solutions and a better world. Because it's only when we're questioning everything that we can start to innovate. So whether we're designing an app, a piece of furniture, a building, a new cloud service, any artifact that goes into the world and interacts with an existing system, often disrupting what was there before, that we are hoping to change people's lives. A process that I've used and many within the design field use to solve problems is something we call the double diamond, which is you start with a problem, you zoom out to discover insights about that problem from the people that are affected by it through user research, through analysis, through synthesizing your findings. And then it's only by zooming out that you can really start to define and redefine what the problem you're actually solving. And then zooming out again to develop prototypes, different iterations of what a solution could be, testing and refining that solution in order to deliver a final outcome. And I hope that you'll see some examples of applications of this process through these case studies. Our first story involves Vicky with two boys, Morgan and Aiden, who were born with a disease called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is um, a genetic chronic condition of which the average life expectancy is about 40 years old. When you're born with cystic fibrosis, every moment your internal organs, especially your lungs, are constantly secreting mucus, which is starting to drown you in this heavy mucus in your system. And so every day, Vicky has to help her boys do a form of treatment that is called physio, physiotherapy, where the boys use different kinds of devices. And these devices were designed in the 1950s that they blow into and it helps to vibrate their lungs and escalate the mucus out of their system so they can output it. If they don't do this, the mucus eventually starts to get infected and they're prone to lots of different kinds of infections that then can shorten their lifespan. So you, here you can see another device um, that Morgan is using as part of his daily physio. Now, these boys are 15 years old and 18 years old. They'd rather be out playing with their friends than doing this laborious, sometimes painful physio every single day. And so Vicky, their mum, becomes this figurehead in their, in their lives where she's nagging them, she's pushing them to do the physio because she knows it'll save their lives, but they're fighting with her every moment that they can. And so she asked me, how can I incentivize, motivate my boys to do this exercise? It's so difficult, I just wanna be a mum to them. So as part of our process of discovery, I visited with the family to try to understand what this physio was about, what the problems were, and to just observe and discover what the boys really enjoyed. And here is one of the boys playing with 
his other siblings on a video game. What we wanted to do, and here was the insight, which is how do we turn this laborious activity into another activity that the boys really enjoyed, which might be video games. So we started creating ideas and prototypes of turning the physio devices into a controller for a video game. And this is just very lightweight prototyping where here you can see a pressure sensor attached to this device, this physio device, where when the person blows on it, the pressure sensor is triggered and it can be used to drive lights or sounds or even a video game. Here is an early version of that prototype. And again, you can see the iteration on the prototype from hardware tinkering with off the shelf maker PCBs to something that's more refined, 3D printed. And also, you can see the incorporation of a very simple game. Through this iterative prototyping, we were able to get to some solutions that the boys could take home and use in their everyday lives. There he goes. He's so taking off. Come on, Reg. Look at the concentration on his face. We don't ever get that yeah. with physio. But it's working. <laughs> and that coughing is what's needed for cystic fibrosis, isn't it? That's it loosening is. mucus. Blowing into tubes makes cars race. Come on, Reg. Come on, bro. Come on, Morgan. Come on. This is the best thing that could ever happen for us because yeah. I just know that the hardest thing for him to do is physio and that is the, the only thing he needs to do to get better. <laughs> that I'm going to be doing it probably every day now. Like, I think people are going to I'm asking me. How do we go from one prototype to a hundred to a thousand devices? When we started developing this project, many doctors and folks from the medical community contacted us and said, hey, I have patients that are in the exact same condition. We have kids in our hospital wards that would love to have this device. So then we sought to scale up our product through key partnerships. We worked across Microsoft, the University College of London, Great Ormond Street Hospital, and through all of this, the aim was to see if we could take that one insight of, hey, how do we transform this laborious exercise into gaming into something that thousands, tens of thousands of children across the UK could do? The other piece that we recognized that was that we really needed to create bespoke games for this device because the controller only had the breath to control these video games. And here is where we needed a diverse set of new thinking, new skills. We ran hackathons, bringing students from computer science courses across the UK to develop these games. And so it's really about that diversity of teams to create this ecosystem to support these kids with cystic fibrosis. Next, I'm gonna talk about Armin. Armin is a girl in the UK. When she was eight years old, she had a horrific car accident with her family. She sustained damage to her brain and initially she couldn't walk, but eventually she was able to regain a lot of her capacity. She was able to walk, go back to school. And the only lasting challenge she had was that she had lost her ability to retain long-term memory. She would go to school and she would not be able to remember what the teacher would tell her. She would go to school and she would not be able to remember what the teachers were instructing her to do in school. So she couldn't do her schoolwork. At home, she would go on a picnic with her family to the park and then she wouldn't remember that picnic at all. So she was at risk of losing her sense of childhood. Through the discovery process, we tried different techniques to figure out how do we help her regain her memory, her capacity to remember things. So we took her on a boating trip in Cambridge where she took photos using a Polaroid camera. And then afterwards, we asked her to remember the events in those photos. She took these photos and then we had these photos in front of her afterwards. And we said, hey, Amon, can you help us remember can you tell us what happened in these photos? And then she looked at me 
And she was just so bewildered because she couldn't actually remember what happened an hour ago on this outing. But then her mum, who was sitting next to her, started to tell her the story of these photos. And as her mum told her the story, Amon's face lit up because she could start to remember when her mum was helping her through storytelling. And I love this photo because it captures the moment when Amon remembered and how happy she was and she had that smile on her face. So then we said, well, how can we build a companion for Amun where she has her memories and the stories of those memories that her mum and her family can tell her? So we created a tool that allowed Amun's family members to upload photos from her past and record audio stories associated with those photos so that throughout her life, Amun would have this photo album with recorded stories attached to them. I remember like waking up, mm. but then I like don't remember what I did after that. We went for a family wedding. We just literally remember waking up in hospital. They kind of just said, she's not gonna make it. it everything was, was baby steps. She literally had to learn how to eat again, how to talk, how to walk. It was almost like having a newborn baby. What was the third instruction? Can you remember? Uh, no. I think we need two fixes. One to help her with her classroom so that she's not falling behind the rest of the class and one to help her with her family memories so that she can just remember her childhood. The code is killing me. Uh... It's a tablet that sits next to you. So as the teacher is giving the lesson, you'll see the text of what they're saying appear on the screen. If Miss Powell says something, um, I can just play it back on this. Yes. yes. And so if you try it, there, so there you go. Um, and then the other thing you can do is in class, if Miss Powell says something, <laughs> 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 During the monopoly. I don't remember I that. But you still had that smile on your face, Amit. I remember <laughs> that. I remember <laughs> that. So, just to be clear, it works. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see how technology as a companion can really transform someone's life can transform how they're able to go about their day to day. I want to tell you the story of William, who as a baby suffered a stroke and a heart attack, which left him with debilitating epileptic seizures. The seizures were so bad that his parents have to monitor him at all times to ensure that he doesn't fall into a state where he can never wake up. And this includes monitoring him all night as he's sleeping. So every night, one of his parents takes turns to stay up all night to watch him. And when he has a seizure, if it goes on for too long, the parent has to administer an injection or call the ambulance. You can imagine William is now six years old and he, his parents haven't been able to sleep. Five-year-old William okay. has epilepsy. Oh, it doesn't matter how many times he does it, it still kills me every time. His parents, Pete and Tanya, have to watch him day and night. If he doesn't recover, within 15 minutes, he has to go to hospital. Computer scientist Haiyan has come to help. Standard nighttime epilepsy monitors don't work for William. Unfortunately, it's never picked up one of William's. One, he's too light. Uh, two, the sensors are very specifically placed and he's never really sleeping center. His parents take it in turns to stay up at night to watch him on a screen. They use phones to time his seizures and keep track of when they give him medicine. You know, it's that, it's that constant anxiety, that constant worry. What we have is 
odds and ends cobbled together in a, a, a kind of piecemeal solution. I don't know how much longer we can do it for. I'm seriously, just too tired. It's one of the hardest challenges ever faced by Haiyan and her fellow inventors. How can we ever be assured that we could build something that could detect his seizures 100% of the time so that his parents will feel Comf you know, will feel safe to go to bed. Because if there was one time out of a thousand that it didn't detect it and something went wrong, I don't, I don't think we could guarantee that we could build anything like that. What we want to do is make a monitoring system, not an alarm system. I think the best people to detect when William's having a seizure is his parents. And we can just make their lives so much easier through technology. Will Hyun's invention change their lives? Hyun's here. Here we go. Look. Wow. Look at that, William. Uh, William look. It's called the Aura, and it's an integrated monitoring system for William. So the Aura Hub is streaming the video and also sound. But the, the other thing that you can do, which is what's special about it, is that if you didn't want to watch the video, you can. Heartbeat. This is heart rate. It's wow. William's heartbeat. That's amazing. And if it goes above the danger level for the heart rate, it'll um, sound an alarm. But you can also have. Oh wow. It's just so much calmer than just staring at that screen, almost yeah. waiting for something to happen. When he does have a seizure, you can start the t the timer. Oh my god. Oh man. Fantastic idea. We're there struggling with our phones, trying to turn the torch on and try and look at the time. It's become so normal for us, hasn't it, for one of us to sit and just watch that monitor. It's just kind of suddenly dawned on me that, you know, we don't have to. Oh, thank you. It's been a massive little help. And in all these cases, you can see that technology has a role to play. Sometimes it can only have a peripheral role to make things easier. It might not be able to fully alleviate the burden of someone's life. But I believe that as technology improves in sensing capability, processing capability, Eventually, we will be able to fully alleviate some of the burdens that these parents and these people are facing. Finally, I want to introduce you to Project Emma. Emma is a, a young woman that I met that I really connected with because as a young graphic designer, she was making her way in London in the design industry in technology and when she was 28 years old, she was diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's disease. The disease worked its course and gave her a tremor in her hands that wouldn't go away, which meant for her as a designer, she was unable to carry out her day-to-day -day duties to sketch, to draw, to work with clients. So you can see this is her writing with her tremor. I met her and I really wanted to see if we could use technology in some way to support her. Through my readings of medical research around tremors, both in Parkinson's and a central tremor, I was able to find an insight around the idea of priming. Um, so this is a concept where someone might be um, having a tremor or another kind of symptom. And if they have a metronome, if they have a, a regular sound or sensory input, it helps them regulate their ability to control their limbs. I know it's a little bit wild. And how we discovered this was um, myself and the team, we visited uh, a charity called Parkinson's UK. And we just asked, we didn't know what we were really looking for, but we asked Parkinson's UK to put on a table all of the different devices that they sold to 
people with Parkinson's to try to help them in their everyday. So there were lots of different devices. They have a catalog. You know, they had a device that was, hey, here's a microphone and a, um, a little personal amplifier. So that because when you have Parkinson's, your voice gets weak because your vocal cords vibrate. And um, having your own microphone and speaker helps your voice actually get out there so that other people can hear you. And on the table, I saw this Korg metronome and I said, well, why do you have this? And they said, well, some people, they find that when they have another kind of symptom, which is uh, called freezing gait, when they're walking and they're una unable to move forward because they lose control of their legs, they take out this metronome and they listen to it and it makes a ticking sound. And the regular ticking sound somehow enables them to regain control of their brain and their limbs and they're able to move forward again. At the same time in the literature, there was some research around vibration and how vibration might help someone with tremor. So combining those two insights, I was able to create a vibrating watch that vibrated at a regular frequency. And I said, hey, let's let's create this prototype and let's try it out. It's a hunch. So we tried it out. And amazingly, Emma, when she hit the right frequency on the vibration, was able to regain control of her fingers and hands to write clearly again. All right, I'm going to try and replicate this here. We're off to a great start. I tend to kind of just avoid doing sketching and writing now because it's just, it's not really worth it if you get something like that. Anything you could do that would just make my hand do what I want it to do and yeah. to be able to sign yeah. my name would be an incredible thing. How do we even just begin to help her overcome this this particular symptom of her tremors and helping her be able to regain her writing ability, her drawing ability. You know, I, I don't think we're ever going to get that back 100%. You know, my challenge is, is uh, I mean, it's immense. Someone's made a spoon. It actually counteracts the tremors you get from Parkinson's. So the spoon actually right. vibrates in opposition to how your hand might be shaking, and it's therefore it is steady. I'm making a, a very rough prototype. And what this board does is I can connect into it through these wires, these tiny coin cell motors. So these motors will vibrate. Hello. Hi, I'm Alison. It's affecting something. I don't quite know what's happening. Something is going on with it. What this is doing is it's short circuiting whatever feedback loop there is between the brain and the hand that's causing the tremors. I'm on to something, right? I'm on, I'm on to something. makes me forget that I have a tremor. <laughs> I haven't drawn one of them for a long time. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> casual about it. Yeah, I'm just going to draw a straight line. I've actually just written my name for like the first time in ages. I can't believe it. Mum, it's called the Emma. It's got my name on it. <laughs> and then here is something that Emma wrote for me from her tremor to wearing the watch. And I think she writes it beautifully, which is, 
her writing is not going to be perfect, but it's better. And this is where technology plays that role to augment us to help us be better. And I really feel strongly that everybody in the audience today could have the capacity to create new solutions to support a single person or a community or a group in creating something better, in doing something better and having better lives. Moving on to thinking about that diversity in voices, in skills, one of the tools that Microsoft is creating to bring digital skills to tens of millions of people is a program that provides free access to content in LinkedIn, Microsoft Learn, GitHub Learning Lab. So through this, as you are going about your career to progress to the next level, here is a resource that you can tap into to gain the next level of skills to solve problems with technology. And here, Microsoft Vision is a connected system of learning that helps empower everyone to pursue lifelong learning. That is an approach that I truly believe in. Every day that I come into work, I'm always learning. And I consider myself to be on this journey of lifelong learning. As you think about your career, it is valuable to look at what are the different career paths out there and how do you move forward in yours or how do you transition between career paths? This tool, I believe, will help you do that. Across Xbox, we have a diversity of roles from engineers to data scientists, to program managers, to user experience designers, to researchers, to business analysts. Every skill has a role to play in this technology future. We hope that this can be a tool to guide you in that future. At the same time, it's also very important for us to think about at the macroeconomic level, what are the trends and the data insights that can help governments and institutions to plan for their education curriculums and their career planning for their constituents. So that's why the tool is also surfacing trends for employers and trends for governments. Another aspect of upskilling and learning that's very important is to connect learning new skills with tangible and sometimes fun case studies. In this example, we are leveraging basketball stats and the new movie Space Jam to teach people about machine learning. So here, someone who can take on this course and use real basketball stats to learn the basic programming methods and tools for doing machine learning and predicting the next sets of stats. I wanted to tie together my personal journey with all of these resources and the importance of embracing a growth mindset. That's been one of the biggest changes at Xbox to embrace the idea that rather than a know-it-all culture, we can build a learn-it-all culture. At Microsoft, our CEO Satya Nadella talks about lifelong learning. And going back to my childhood in China, that's been an approach that's really worked for me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Hayan of Xbox, Microsoft, for that great session to kickstart our morning. Really inspiring story and inspiring digital skills to help others live a better life through technology and digital solutions. We will now be moving forward to our next session of the day. It will begin very shortly. So do click join session and also complete the survey for each session for us to continuously serve you better. And in the meantime, do visit the hashtag My Digital Workforce Week at mydigitalworkforceweek.my, where we have over 5,000 jobs available from 100 companies across the industry. So for more information on the details, check on the comment sessions at the right. See you in a bit.